going to talk about a library I developed uh, at Work Scoot, although this presentation is not so much about Scoot. In fact, I don't want to spend all the time talking about Scoot, and if we get too much into that, I'll kind of, you know, short circuit and go some other things. It's really more about some of the design decisions that I made in designing it. Well, design decisions. Decisions I made in designing it. Some of the trade-offs. So a lot of this is about general library development. It's also geared towards people that are not the gurus, because I work with people that have done a certain amount of C++ programming. Very few of them are gurus. In fact, I don't know of anybody else from Boeing that's here at Boost. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I don't know of anybody else that has. You know what? Well, indirectly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. There was somebody else. Yeah. Oh, was there? Oh, yeah, he met me on the street. Uh, you should introduce me then. Of course, it's probably, you know. Probably in the other room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I give this presentation, or at least portions of it, all of this is, the, the sum total of this is new, but pieces of this I've given to people I work with. And again, some of them are really good developers, but not necessarily good with generic design, good with, you know, static polymorphism, et cetera, et cetera. I'm also going to talk some because uh, a lot of the developers I work with are just now really getting up speed with Boost and using different libraries of Boost. So I'll talk a little bit of how I integrated some of these libraries in there. Other people is, of course, people that, like Chris, fanboys. I don't know if we have any fangirls here. And I like to make fun of Twilight the movie, so. <laughs> so again, I'm going to talk a little bit about Scoob, but again, that's not my main focus. But I'm going to talk about what motivated the library, what the goals, requirements are, obviously some of the functionality, but more importantly, the design approaches, the trade-offs, some of the C++ techniques I used in there. Going to be some example code. Uh, depending on how time goes, for those of you that are real familiar with, with bind, you know, we may want to skip through that or through there. Uh, the other thing we do, we're going to have, you know, lots of fun dancing. Okay. So first thing is what? Can we start with that part? Sure. Well, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to it soon. So the first thing, we have to, we have to give the proper, proper, you know, stuff for Chris. Yay! Yay! You know, of course, we, we should probably do it a little bit more uh, enthusiastically. Warning, I will have some fun. I hope everybody else will have some fun in there. For those of you that haven't figured out, Chris sitting over there is the Boost ASIO author. ASIO, sorry. Oh, yeah. Little, little note there at the bottom there. Won't say anything more about that. Okay, so I've been <laughs> developing a C++ for a while. Uh, a lot of it's with networking software, a lot of distributed processing. I've been at Boeing about eight years. Um, the group I'm in does simulation software for airborne warning systems. Um, in particular, we have mission computing software, which is the software that integrates a bunch of sensors, deals with uh, the GUI systems for the operators that are, work there, that are sitting on the AWACS, data links, a whole bunch of stuff like that. I've done both infrastructure for the mission computing as well as simulation software that we're doing now. I work with some good engineers, although not that many of them are good in software design. Okay. So they're good at solving problems, they're good at writing code, they're not necessarily at thinking about reuse, they're not necessarily good about thinking, okay, how can I write something that is going to cross, you know, be useful across multiple products? And that's one of the challenges that Boeing software is dealing with is that they've dealt with typically different customers and customizing that. Yes, Dave? I'm trying to envision what it looks like to be good at writing code, but, but totally weak in software design. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess, that's, I guess that's a little bit of a, yeah. Well, I, maybe it isn't. I, I mean, think about it for a minute. It, it, is there something that you have to say about about what they do when they're coding that's, that's really positive, but it doesn't go into that area of software design? A lot of them have C backgrounds. Uh, a lot of them have ADA backgrounds. Um, uh, I'll see the question here in a minute. Um, you bad software yes, design. yes, no. Um, <laughs> well, I, I guess... Maybe they're not familiar with the kind of design that, uh, that he's doing with the project. 
Yeah, more, more of the software for reuse um, of generic design. Again, uh, an engineer, here's a good problem in my group, okay? They've learned inheritance, they've learned what virtual functions are, they don't know effectively how to use them. So basically, there's way too much inheritance, you know, five, six, seven level, level deep inheritance hierarchies that are really nothing more than a way of kind of code use, downcasting. So it's like, okay, they, they've, under, they've learned this keyword called, you know, inheritance, well, public and inherit from something. They really haven't thoroughly yet learned what it is to write designs or to come up with designs that are truly polymorphic, you know, can meet the Liskov substitution principle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm trying to get them to think more about those kinds of issues, those kinds of techniques, rather than go do this, write this code here, it works, it's tested, okay, let's do something else. Oh, well, it's almost the same. I'm going to copy and paste, change a few things, do that over and over and over again. So I know there's a couple other hands there. Yeah, Marshall. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, I've worked with people like that who, uh, who are really good at working in the small and, mm -hmm. and have trouble working in the large. Okay. Yes, that's another, good, that's another good way of describing it. So, okay. Yeah. I was oh, saying yeah. they're really good at getting something done really fast. They are really fast at getting something which kind of works. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I sometimes ask myself, if, isn't this kind of enough, isn't it? Well, they get it done fast, and they get it done the second time when they do it, they do it still faster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks. Okay, so I'll briefly talk a little bit about, um, again, I, I've, uh, this is a little bit of the environment that I work in. The mission computing is the software that runs on the AWAC systems that ties together a whole bunch of different subsystems. Tends to be Lots of different platforms, lots of different operating systems, lots of different um, languages. Simulation's a little bit more constrained, but we also deal with multiple platforms. Um, Linux and Windows, obviously, we also do some Solaris stuff. Um, it's all distributed, all networked together. Some of the, the, the subsystems and sensor systems are embedded systems. Our networking environment, um, there are some Corva and DDS uh, that we use in there. I know I was talking with, uh, I think it was Sumant, that's from RTI, which RTI puts out the uh, DDS product. Um, most of it is peer-oriented peer and non-centralized. In other words, lots of systems running independently of each other that do need to send data back and forth and coordinate the data, but it's not a whole lot of client-server, not a lot of master-slave type of processing. Constant and consistent network traffic, but not a huge amount of it. Okay, a lot of sub-binary data. Okay, I'm going to talk today a little bit about wire protocols with networking. Does everybody know that term? Kind of? Okay. That, that's the protocol that defines the data as it goes out over the network, all the bits and bytes and, and what makes up your messages, whether you've got headers and message bodies or comma delimited or, or Line, uh, line feed delimited, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Pretty much all the standard IP protocols, we're not using SCTP that I know of, but TCP, UDP, multicast. Not really much SSL because uh, most of the, the environment itself is secure. All the gateways and stuff have to deal with lots of encryption and security and stuff, but I typically don't have to deal with that myself. So a little bit about my library. Again, as you can see from the environment, it is also peer-oriented. It works well with lots of different systems talking back and forth that are kind of independent of each other. This is one of the key things, generic. And that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about that. And of course, generic means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, my group, the simulation software, has about 12 different socket libraries and I'm working to replace them all with Scoop. Within probably the, the bigger site that I'm at, there's probably another couple dozen socket libraries. Um, some of them use open source libraries such as ACE, and I'll talk about that in just a second. 
Some of them are just you know down to the to the socket interface. Um, none of them are generic. So as far as I know, I'm the only person in in my area that I'm working at that has written this particular library that will handle any wire protocol and will be able to allow the application to define how it is that you want to structure your messages and how you want to structure the processing of that data without having to copy and paste the code or do some kind of recompile or some kind of other you know old style way of doing it. For those of you that have been in the um, ASIO and or done with ASIO, you're very familiar with callback stuff, okay? This is 100% callback based, no wait, there's no blocking in the API anywhere. Multiple protocol support, and we'll talk some more about this, the connections and states and stuff like that. Okay? So, I think it's time for a little, get a little music here going here. I just figured it'd be, you know, not too serious. As I said, there are many different libraries. Some, t some, some of them are using uh, open source, such as Ace. Okay. So let's talk about. Oops! Ah! Didn't mean to do that. There we go. Yes, Dave. I just wanted to mention. Many people overlook this. That when they're doing generic libraries, what you did is exactly what you're supposed to do when mm -hmm. building a generic library. That is, look Good. at lots and lots of other implementations mm -hmm. and, and generalize from that. Mm -hmm. And many people try to generalize from, you know, from what they think the generality is in their head and usually that leads to a bad design. I've certainly made that mistake myself. Mm -hmm. So it's really good to see that in action. Yes, and there's no way this library would have came together the way that it did without me having done multiple iterations of it or things similar to it for the, for the last number of years. Uh, another question in there? Just a quick question. A couple slides ago you mentioned that for the EDS. Is oh, it, yes. Is this meant to be a, a replacement for those types of... Ah, good question. Thank you. So to rephrase, is this library meant to, to fill in where Cobra and DDS reside? No. No, this library is purely a socket-oriented library. For those that if you have simple, straightforward, you know, I need to do TCP connection here and send some data over, over that. Um, I'll get a little bit into frameworks you know, versus libraries. And I, I think Chris has talked a little bit about frameworks versus toolkits and a little bit of, I think you did the other day, correct? But um, this is not meant to be a comprehensive framework or distributed processing system such as DDS and Corba. Is, is, who, has anybody else worked with either DDS or Corba? I know a few people have, okay. So you, you know a little bit of kind of the, the, the goals and the the challenges of those kinds of systems, which this library is not or oriented towards. So, good, good, good question, thanks. Primary goal, I call it message framing. I don't know if there's a, a better term for it. It's, it seemed to be a good one for what we want to do. Obviously, a generic library can't define what the message framing is. In other words, it can't define, my library doesn't know what your wire protocol is. It can't say, okay, well, you know, it must be eight bytes of length followed by two bytes of message type followed by variable length of data, okay? That may work for a very limited set of customers or applications. It won't work for others. That's one of the key, probably the key bit of variability is that the app has to provide to Scoot what is the message framing. Okay. So that's one of the key goals. Okay. And obviously they provide the hooks for that. One of the nice little things from that is that Scoot knows nothing about Indianness. It knows nothing about byte swapping. Okay. Because that really is 100% of the message framing and or wire protocol aspect, okay? That was a little bit with BSD socket stuff that you gotta deal with that's all handled by the ASIO library. But in general, there is none of that that I have to take care of. Another thing that I do that had some challenges, and in fact, 
This is where a lot of the design trade-offs I'm going to talk about is dealing with this abstraction. And this is one of the key abstractions of the library, is it makes it as similar as possible, but not 100%, to abstract of a lot of the differences between TCP, UDP, multicast, etc. You can't get 100% there because there are some fundamental differences between TCP and UDP. TCP is a stream-oriented protocol, and UDP is a datagram-oriented protocol. Is everybody familiar with differences? No. Okay. No. Um, TCP, you get a byte at a time. There is no message boundary. There is no delimiters in the protocol itself. You have to determine that application, or something does. UDP, you will get a chunk of data in that datagram, and that's what you get. Okay. And that's, that's a fundamental difference of it. So that does make things a little bit different, different and we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. As another example, when you send something over UDP, you are limited to a maximum size. In TCP, since you're sending streams of data, you can just keep sending however much data. There's probably some big, huge maximum on the, on the, the send call, but usually that's not an issue. Okay, and we'll see some of these differences in, in bullet two there. Okay, now, as much as I love ASIO and I, and I love writing the asynchronous code, the developers I work with do not want to have to deal with that. Okay, a lot of them do not know asynchronous style, even though I'm trying to get them more up to speed. And this library takes care of all of that kind of messy details. By messy, they're fun details, and stuff you have to do if you're writing to the ASIO API. But not everybody does. What, did, what music did I put here? Oh, just more. <laughs> more applause for Chris, thank you. Okay. So from the other day, for example, come on applause, come on. I didn't know it was that long, okay. <laughs> so um, as uh, Chris talked about the other day, uh, one of the aspects of programming to the ASIO model is you are calling async calls and you typically have a chain of calls that you do that provides the different logic to get things done. Um, you know, one of the common problems I've seen on the ASIO email list is you know, somebody writes two or three writes in a row or fires off two or three async writes without completing them. That can cause you problems, okay? So this doesn't let you get into those kind of problems. It just says, this is the way underneath it's gonna be doing for you. Everything is event-driven. Um, a lot of developers I work with are not that familiar. They're starting to become, especially in a simulation system, it's a perfect fit for event-driven designs, event-driven models, okay? So I'm not going to go too much into that. I think a lot of people are familiar here. So um, one of the things, though, it's no wait. You provide callbacks. All the callbacks are invoked based on different kinds of event. Could be incoming data. Could be connection setup or tear down. Could be errors. Okay. The usage model is an event state model. We'll get some more into that. Okay. And the library defines and constrains the different states that the application in effect can be in when it's dealing with the different kinds of data going out. Okay. So we'll talk about that in, coming up as well. Now this is, this is one of the things I think is really nice about ASIO. It does not embed any kind of threading architecture underneath the covers. It's up to the application. Okay. You can run a single thread, you run a thread pool. There's different trade-offs to each of those. This library follows that same kind of design. And it says, you know, if you want to run it in a single thread, it's really, well, it's really designed well to do that. If you want to run a thread pool against it, there's a few other things you've got to deal with. But it's up to the application to deal with that. Okay? One of the byproducts is it actually, the library itself, does not have mutexes or threads underneath. And the way it does that is by when something that the application hands off to the library, it simply posts that to the IO service, and then 
the IO service thread itself takes care of that. Now, if you have multiple threads running against the Scoot library, then there's some more things that have to be done. But if you run a single thread, the only mutexes that are locked are those that are locked either with the ASIO or by the operating system itself. It does make for very efficient resource usage, okay? Especially for a lot of the, again, my environment tends to have a lot of connections, but not a huge amount of traffic. I want to make it simple to use, hard to misuse. Okay. And we'll talk about some of these things as it comes up in here. Weak pointers, value classes. I control exactly where the ASIO classes or the classes that, I, that are inside Scoot that interact with ASIO. So I have very strong control of shut down, starting, stopping, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And provide some default things. One of the key things, and this is true also of ASIO, is that the sending and receiving of data is a separate process from connection setup, connection teardown, okay? So it abstracts and separates those concerns, and that's key to making a lot of things simpler for the application. It just says, okay, this piece of code over here deals with starting, connection, et cetera. This other pieces of code, and again, I'm dealing with groups that's you know, dozens or hundreds of developers, lots of lines of code, and so you don't have one person typically that's doing all the code for a particular piece of functionality. So it simplifies that. Okay. The other thing is that Scoot, you know, I think it's a good library, but there's some cases, some things that it doesn't do well. So I don't try to, to satisfy everybody. In particular, there's one communication pattern that's very difficult to do, and that is if you want to send a request, block and wait for a reply. I have already mentioned that the API is no wait, so I mean, how would you, to begin with, do that? Plus, the other thing is the sends and the receives tend to be separated from each other in different interfaces, and so matching up a particular reply to a particular message at Senate is difficult with this library. So there, there's one constraint there. If, you're, if everything that you're doing is 100% high throughput, you know, you're maxing out your, your network connections, you know, there is some overhead in here. I don't think the abstraction penalty is great. I haven't measured it yet, but it's, it's, it's some, it's not a lot, but there may be some applications, some needs that this is not a good fit for. As again, I talked about earlier, I don't deal with the marshalling. I don't deal with the serialization. Okay. I don't deal with other nice functionalities such as chaining multiple together, together multiple callbacks, which, which is a nice feature of some libraries. Don't deal with thread pools. So that simplifies the library. Let that be done in a higher level, in a framework type of thing. Okay, I won't spend too much time about use case development um, other than you know, it's key, it's critical. If you notice, I spent some time defining exactly what the goals and the motivations for this library is. All of that fits in to the use cases there. By the way, I did write some, not a huge amount, but some sample code to try out some of the APIs I had in mind. I was able to reuse some of that code in the unit tests. Okay. And in particular, some of the code became mock classes. Is everybody familiar with mock? Unit testing mock classes, okay. I'm actually relatively new to that, but it's, it's pretty neat stuff, okay. And in particular, this one is key. The use cases allowed me to say, okay, what is this library good for? What is this library not good for? Clarify what the trade-offs I had to make within there, okay. And again, no library can do everything. Well, some of this is, you know, went into the documentation of it as well, so. Okay, so, uh, is event-based I.O. and kind of the inversion of control new to a lot of people? Some? Not everybody? Yeah? Okay. Um, this follows, again, the idea that your application hands off function objects or callbacks to the library, and the library evokes, invokes those functions and callbacks, function objects, in the context of the I.O. service thread. 
And this is very familiar for, the, for those of you that, are, that have done much event-based I.O. The idea there is that every action is triggered by some event and depending on what the event is, different things will happen in there. Okay. Incoming outgoing data, connect, disconnects, errors, timers, data that's queued up for outgoing data, or application defined handlers that get posted to IO servers. There's probably other events that I haven't listed that I didn't think of. Whew, okay, I think it's time before we get into some design stuff. So now everybody can get up and dance, okay? There we go. I kind of like this. It's free music, free, free uh, royalty, royalty free music. I know it's kind of... Just trying to keep us awake after lunch. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, had, I had a big lunch and I, I, know the, I, know the, uh, I know the issue there, so. Well, you know, also I don't want to just, you know, do the same, you know, be all serious and, you know, keep going, keep going and going. It's, it's, it's sometimes good to take a mental break. I do that a lot when I'm, when I'm designing, writing code. So, you've got an idea now of what motivated this library. So I'm going to get into some of the, the classes, not all of them, but, but some of the main classes that are the public classes that makes up the library. Okay. So, in particular, there's one I ended up calling embankment. I have a slide here about naming. This will be kind of fun there. Okay. But the embankment is, that's the one, one of the key classes that provides that association between the application and the TCP connection, or potentially a UDP sender, receiver, multicaster, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and of course TCP can be of two flavors, whether you're the one doing the connect or you're the one doing the accept. The embankment the one that abstracts that and provides a simple API for doing things with it, okay? In particular, it allows you to start and stop processing on that, okay? which may mean you start it, it does a port bind, starts accepting, or you start it, it may st it actually go out and do an active connect, or you start it and it actually does a port bind and starts listening for UDP datagrams, or join a multicast group. Okay? It's also the place where, I think all of them, yeah, all of the callbacks are registered with the library. In particular, there's three main callbacks I'm going to talk about. I already briefly mentioned the message framing. We'll get into that a little bit more. The incoming message handling, and these two work together. And the connection state change callback. What that allows you is to customize in your application what happens or what you want to do from there when a connection is brought up, when a connection is brought down, whenever there's an error. All the stuff that is outside of the data transfer, but is important to you. Okay. Yeah, here's the name things, right? I'll start up my ominous music here. Because <laughs> didn't we didn't we just have a couple of uh, heated discussions about names a few a month or so ago? Still. Still. Okay. <laughs> Oops, I'll go back there. So yeah. I, I, I do. Never worry about <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you, you, you don't participate in no, the name discussion, do you? Know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this, this class went through many iterations of names. Okay, so I'll, I won't talk about all of them, but just to let you know that I think names are important. Okay. So, here's one of the key interfaces to the embankment, and that is the start method right there. Okay. And that is where you provide the message frame object. I haven't talked about the requirements on the message frame type, but this is where you provide that, okay? So this is kind of a, a naive initial design. Well, let's templatize the embankment class, okay? Let's make the message frame part of the type of that class, okay? There's a couple of drawbacks to it. One of, the, one of my goals, is a usability goal, and I, actually, I don't know if I actually listed that up in the other ones, um, is that for the application code, I'm trying to keep from pushing too many template types, or too much of the, the, the parameterization of the types, 
into the application space. I want that to be similar to a boost function, if everybody knows of that, which the function itself is not templatized. Obviously, you can push stuff into it that's templatized. And in particular, and this is more of a, a real constraint, is that if I make the message frame part of the embankment class, I can't change the message frame during the lifetime of the embankment object. Now, with the start taking the message frame, one of the things that the library does not allow you to do is to dynamically change the message frame type during the lifetime of a start and stop. But you can start something, stop it, start it again, and give it a different message frame with this. Okay. Now, everybody here, I imagine, is very familiar with member function templates. And I work with people that don't think of that. They just automatically think a template means you've templatized your class. And so this is kind of a, a new world to think, well, maybe you need to think about where it is that you're providing your variability that is based on type. And in many cases, you really want to vary the types only on your methods, you know, your member functions. So this actually makes more sense. The embankment class is not templatized. The start method is, and that's where you're going to pass in the particular customized message frame object. Okay? So again, variability, method invocation at the class level. By the way, ASIO, I mean, it's not that there's a whole lot. There are some templatized classes, obviously, that make sense where they are. But all the real processing is done with handlers that are templatized. And that's where the real variability with an ASIO. It, it, each given call, you can templatize, or is templatized, and you can pass different stuff in. In fact, you typically will do that. Okay? So again, this is, this is really more to the people I work with and a lot of developers, I don't know. They don't fully appreciate the power of member function templates. Okay? A little side discussion is probably not for here because everybody pretty familiar with standard library taking parameters by value. Right. Okay. So a couple of more, or I'm sorry, this is the, yeah, this is talking about the message frame callback. Okay, so one of the, the, the requirements on that is it is a function object that you're passing in. So somewhere in there, there needs to be an operator parentheses or something that gives you that result. Okay. This also is where the buffer that the scoot library is going to use, which is an ASIO buffer, is uh, passed back to the scoot library. Okay. One of the things I had to be careful about is the message frames passed in is copied by value, you know, as you typically do on a lot of uh, these kinds of uh, classes. I have to be careful since state and data is stored within there about when it is copied. So that's part of the, the API, part of the documentation, is I state clearly, okay, when it's copied, when it's not. Because there's times that if it's copied, then the application may, you know, not be happy about that. So the way that these two fit together, the message frame is responsible for the wire protocol. It determines the beginning of a message, end of a message. It tells Scoot, you know, information that Scoot uses. Okay. It tells Scoot, I've got a message ready. You know, it may have been a single UDP datagram. It may be a string of bytes that came in through TCP. When it tells Scoot it's ready, Scoot then invokes the incoming message callback. Okay. And we'll talk some more about that. I'll also briefly mention the connection state change callback, and that's the one that's invoked when connections are ready. They're brought up when connections are disconnected. Okay. Any kind of state change, an error, because okay, an error is going to invoke different things. So one of the things that these callbacks do is simplify the error handling and return to the APIs, the classes, the methods that the application calls. Because except for a few pretty minor, you know, bool type of returns, all of the error handling is centralized to one place, and that is the connection state change callback. Okay, so output data, there's no errors. Okay, it's either queued. Well, actually, 
I should be careful. There, if it can't queue the data, there is an error. But once the data is queued, that's all the application worries about. Okay? For incoming data, the incoming message callback only gets called in good states. Okay? In other words, Scoot tells the application, you got a message, everything's good. Go do what you're going to do with that message. Okay? Otherwise, error and this callback gets invoked. Okay? So it allows the application to have one place to define where all the error handling for the networking is going to be. So that brought up a design question. Do I want three template parameters on my start method? Okay, that's one way to do it, and there, there still may be some advantages to doing this. So, if I actually get permission to open up the library to the public, you know, maybe we'll actually end up with this. What I currently have is one template parameter, okay, and two type defs of boost functions. Okay, so why did I do that? Okay, boost function is one form of type erasure. So if I go back up the previous one there, you'll see that these callbacks have to get passed on to multiple places in the Scoot library. We're not going to look at a whole lot of the internal code, but there is a little bit of example code where I talk about that. I would have to pass along those three template parameters in one form or fashion all the way through different layers of the library and through, through different method invocations. Yeah, you know, that's not bad, but this does make it easier. So it allows you to provide a callback to these boost function objects. And there's things that boost function can do. There's not too many places inside the Scoot library I need this. But there is a place or two in that a boost function allows you to store the callback and not immediately pass it on to the lower layer, to the lower layer methods. Okay? So in other words, in effect, it's erased the type, even though it knows internally what the type is, or some form of fashion, I haven't looked at the internals of boost function that much, and allows you to provide a stateful function object that is genericized, Obviously, it has to, meet, has to have a certain function object signature that allows you to store it you know, as a member, member variable and use it later on versus immediately passing it on down a call chain to lower la layers of stuff. Okay. In particular, the start member, start method, can't easily store that. It's just going to pass it along because it's, it's a method. I would have to store it somewhere in a, in a member variable or do something else with it if I don't pass it on. Okay, so here is some of the relationship between message frame and incoming message um, callback. And I'll talk about this, you know, member, um, I'm sorry, template type deaths in just a second. But in particular, one of the key aspects, and to me I think one of the areas that it also makes it flexible and generic, is that the message frame is an object that's used to collect the data, to collect the message, is also passed as a parameter to the incoming message callback. And then the application can, inside the incoming message callback, interrogate data from the message frame itself. So instead of me, i.e. the Scoot library designer, telling the applications, well, you have to have a method called get header, or you know, a template called to get header or something like that, or you have to have a method called get data, or is valid. That's completely up to the application. The application in the message frame type defines what it is the public API to use, and then that gets passed in to the incoming message callback. The incoming message says, I got a message, I'm going to interrogate the message frame object, and then do whatever else I need to do with that. Could pass it on, could de you know, unserialize it, unmarshal it, whatever it is it's going to do there. So it's completely up to the application. That's a key thing in there. Okay. Any questions on that piece of functionality? Can you go back yeah, to the Jeff. For, well, I haven't really given you the Oh. Full signature for which one? Maybe that, well, for uh, start. Ah, okay. 
Yeah, I, I don't think the previous yeah, one. You made the full signature. That's why. I'm yeah. So. This. Yeah. So th this really is the signature of it. Other than I have not given you for the incoming message callback, and I do have examples later on. I haven't told you what that incoming message callback right up here. Right. Yeah. That boost function signature. So that dot dot dot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's actually two parameters, and we'll see some of that. It's I'll, I'll brief. It's a variadic boost function. That's a joke. No, it's yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not a very adic boost function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to think about that for a second. All right, Jeff. Um, <laughs> so the, <laughs> there's actually two parameters in this. Uh, the first parameter is the message frame itself, and the second parameter is something I'll talk about a little bit later coming up called output channel, and that's basically the class that the application used to send outgoing data, and the idea there is that. The message frame is all the incoming collected data for a message. The output channel gives you a way if you want to send, immediately send data back through the, the same connection that it came in, which is a very typical use case. Okay. okay, so that's the relationship between message frame and incoming message callback. However, it would be nice to do something like this at least in C++03, which is, okay, you know, the application is going to actually give me a function object that is meeting the full signature of incoming message callback, but one of those parameters is a template parameter called message frame. Can't do this in C++. So the typical workaround, or C++03, absent template aliases, is just simply define this guy right here. And this is actually how the scoot library provides the type def for the incoming message callback. The application then, or this is actually the signature of the start, and then the application gives the two parameters that meet those function object signatures. Okay. So it makes the syntax a little bit more messy, but it achieves what we want to achieve. Okay. Deep breath now. Everybody good with what I've covered so far? Any questions? Uh, yeah, in the back. How long did you have to go before you realized that even though you're passing your message frame uh, type and, and your uh, callback function, that the callback function would need the message frame? I, mean, I, went, I went down this road before and realized. Oh, have you? Okay. Way too late. Um, but I'm just wondering if, if that was you were just smarter than me or if um, you really got burned on that. I realized it pretty early in Scoot, but again, this is based on five, six years of similar, you know, pre-generic libraries and dealing with these kinds of issues. So I say early in the life of Scoot, but not early in the life of this kind of functionality. So it took me a while to come up to, to finalize this particular design of the relationship between the message frame object, the incoming message callback, and how they wanted to interact. Um, I went down the, the path that, if any of you have looked at CPP NetLib, and you know, Dean uh, Michael Barris, is that right? Is defining a very nice set of requirements and um, ways of pulling apart messages and you know defining header requirements and body requirements and stuff like that. I kind of went down that way, but I decided, you know, for this kind of library, you know, which is not application protocol specific, whereas most of the stuff in CPP NetLib is, is HTTP or et cetera, et cetera, that it makes sense to say, well, instead of me trying to make the application fit a certain model, I'm going to let the application decide it. So that's the message frame. Then I said, okay, well, that is part of the incoming message protocol and then, or incoming message callback. How do I pass that into the incoming message callback? And then, it's, then, then it was obvious at that point. But it took a long time to think through those relationships and, and work that out. But it's a good question, thanks. So, so what did you end up? I'm curious as, as how your design evolved. It seemed like a natural, seemed like a natural assumption. At the time I was setting up uh, what I, the equivalent of the embankment, mm -hmm. that if you're passing in if, if you're passing in your, uh, what do you call it, your message? Uh, message frame? Anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
and your callback that the callback would know the type. So mm -hmm. um, why why bother sending it back? What what I where I ran into an issue is when I had nested message types within that within that standard one, and I I, I didn't want to have to know about all of the different message types. Mm -hmm. It nested in there. I just wanted to have a generic one, and I ended up with things like unions and all kinds of stuff going on before I realized that, geez, if I would just take the information that was given to me and move it on downstream, it can be used later on. Yes, yes. Did everybody hear that? Remember that nobody on the tape can hear the audience. Okay, <laughs> good, good point. Um, I, I'm not sure I can summarize it that well. <laughs> I think everybody in here heard it pretty well, right? That's why it pays to come here. Yes. Um, one other, uh, and this is mostly uh, from a code development and maintenance aspect of the separation of this, and this is directly driven by the environment, the requirements of, of my particular projects, is that the wire protocol logic, the message frame, okay, a lot of time is common and copy or common across multiple applications, multiple different pieces of code, but what you do with the message itself is completely different. Okay? Now I don't know how common that is with other projects and other companies, but in ours we have you know, four or five different wire protocols and 50, 60, 70 different applications. I wanted the ability to write the wire protocol logic once, get it working, and then allow the applications to write, you know, 15 different ways of using that message that came into them. Okay. We define the wire protocols to, and actually we have external customers that follow the same wire protocol. And so, I mean, we have, in this case, we can offer the message frame class and say, if you use a library, here's a message frame. Now, the way you construct your messages and send them out, or the way you process your messages as they come in is completely different, but we're going to make sure that how you decode and put together those messages is done consistently and correctly. So that was another motivation for me of separating those two concerns into separate callbacks. I don't know if you've got that same kind of need or requirements yourself. Ours was more so that we had in essence like a broker distributing multiple message types mm -hmm. and the idea of having to know where to distribute those with different callbacks. Yeah. Um, just sending it to a single callback and having that be able to take that and it understand the header in, in the message frame without having to know all the details within the messages. Yeah. So you like the separation of the concerns, although you don't necessarily need separate code for that. Right. Yeah, cool. Okay. So, um, uh, where was I? Okay, so so I've talked about you know the 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 different variability on the callbacks with the uh, the embankment, the way that the application provides those custom customizations into the embankment. Now this one is a little bit about the implementation of the embankment class. Okay, there is a little bit of of use case in that. In that, I want the embankment to be easily passed around. Okay, create one pass it around to multiple layers of software. And that was a key need for both me, my project and other projects in there, okay? Um, that does provide some interesting needs on the implementation of it, okay? Um, the embankment itself does no network processing itself. It passes all of the starts and stops and callbacks and stuff into internal detail classes that Chris and other people would recognize because they look a lot like example code from from ASIO and, and code that you're writing for TCP connectors and TCP acceptors, etc. But the embankment itself does not encapsulate that. So one of the issues I had there is that the lifetime of the embankment object is divorced from the lifetime of the actual networking slash ASIO objects, okay? Well, how do I manage that? You know, I don't want to have to like have a pointer that can be dangling off or a reference in there. So I decided on boost weak pointers. I already had shared pointers on all of my internal networking objects, as it makes sense to do with ASIO. So I said, well, why not just create a weak pointer? So that was that was a you know a nice use case for weak pointer. There may be other ways that I don't know about or didn't think of that are good, valid ways to, to achieve what I wanted to achieve with that. But the weak pointer 
worked real well. Key thing is that if the object, the networking object, that the embankment is pointing to goes out of scope, it's destroyed, or somehow you've got an embankment in an invalid state, and we can have a whole little side discussion about default constructors, right, which is interesting for people new to C++, not necessary for, your, for you guys. But in, in particular, an exception will be thrown. And this is one of the weaker areas of, of the developers I work with, is they have basically either all the traditional error code or maybe a little bit of exception handling, but no comprehensive exception handling. And I wanted to force the idea that I'm not going to crash, okay? This is actually a perfectly good use case in that your networking object has gone away and your embankment is still valid, but we want you to know that something has gone wrong. We don't want to crash the application, especially in mission critical type of stuff, although the simulation is not quite as mission critical, the mission computing is, which is used in this library. So I want you to throw an exception, and you're going to have to handle it in the application and do something with that, okay? Question? Yes? Uh, a few slides back, you said that you separated out the, uh, the control or the status, if you will, from the data. Uh, was it this slide? Uh, it's further back. I don't know that you have to go back there. Right? I guess my question is, y yeah, okay. right? Yes. So a user of Scoot should not expect to see exceptions if they're properly handling the state change. Ah, good question. I'm going to rephrase that question because I think I, I can. So the user of Scoot should not see exceptions if Scoot itself is properly handling stuff. Is that is that a good statement of your... Okay. Sure. Um, and that is true. In Scoot itself, at least all the networking processing itself does not throw any exceptions up to the application level. So all exception handling or error handling in general inside Scoot is handled within Scoot and invokes this application defined connection state callback, and then the application can decide what it wants to do. It's a boost system error that's provided, and that's what the application then can then decide. What does it go from there? The particular case with the embankment, the back one, here we go, is that embankment's where you start, stop, and register. Now with registering, there's nothing that can really go wrong. But with start and stop, you may be attempting to start or stop a network resource, a connector, or acceptor that has gone away. That particular method call, which is called from the application, can immediately throw an exception. So that is completely independent of what has happened during the lifetime of your connection as it is in a TCP error or multicast is screwed up or something like that. Does, it, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And, 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 that's, and that's a good question because that's one of the things I wanted to do is very well control when error handling calls. Ca I'm sorry, when error handling occurs and how it is handled. That is one of the, the problems, or at least I shouldn't say problems, challenges with callback based or event IO or inversion of control systems is that, well, since I'm not directly calling things and getting error codes or getting exceptions, what happens if something bad happens, okay? An exception gets thrown within a callback, but what's my context? Where do I catch that? What do I do, right? Is, 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 you've obviously run into this. Other people have run into this with similar types of systems. Yeah, so in my case, I say it's simple. You get an error callback on the connection state change. That's it, no, nowhere else is an error during normal network processing allowed to escape from the library. Uh, allow yep. me to follow up and say yes. that has a design trade-off, which is then you separated out error handling, which is good, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, then you have the coordination problem. Yes. Data data Excellent. I'm going to rephrase that. Um, and that's why I say up very, very front that this library is good for a lot of use cases. It's not good for everything because it does complicate a certain few, or I shouldn't say few, certain situations are a little more complicated. And this is a good example of where, okay, you have an error that's occurred, okay, it's, purely, it's completely divorced time-wise and class-wise and code-wise from the code that has registered the callbacks and the callbacks themselves that are provided. So 
Now you have to figure out a way, well, how do I hook that in? Of course, you can, you can uh, provide as part of your connection um, change callback, you know, the, uh, a reference or an object that itself then can go out and do other stuff. But, yes, that's a good point. Okay. And that's a good example of where the trade-offs that you, that you do in, in the applications. And I made some things simpler and a few things not quite as simple. Yes, Ed, right? So, excuse me. So is it fair to say that while the embankment, embankment lifetime is independent of the network resource lifetime, mm -hmm. no, and normally in an application, the embankment object is, is uh, owned by the application and normally will last longer than the network resource? Yeah, so I'm going to restate the question. Um, normally the embankment object would be longer than the lifetime of the network object, so yes. Normally, that, yes. while it is, can be independent, it's Yes. I mean, there's, a, there's association there. It's just the lifetimes are not directly related. Now, you can't get into a valid embankment without asking the Scoot library to give you one. So, so the Scoot library is, is, in effect, a factory for embankments, which makes sense. Um, otherwise, you'd have to have an extra step of associating the embankment with something that Scoot has. So I just said, well, just call whatever create method that, that gives you that. Does that make sense? Does the okay, so does Scoot own the embankment object? No, it gives you an embankment object. It gives you a smart pointer to an embankment object. Well, it gives you an embankment which itself is a weak pointer to something inside the Scoot library. It looks like a value. Excuse oh, it's me? just a value. It looks like a value type. Yes, it is. It's, it's in every, every way and every fashion a value type class. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, oh, I don't want to get to there. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is where we were, correct? Yep. Okay, and we covered this pretty well. Everybody good? Okay, so this is this is this is the actual code. It's just a simple, you know, one line of code. It's a weak pointer to an internal net resource um, of that. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about what net resources are because it does have a few interesting design things I'm going to talk about. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because then it would become a how to program and use ASIO class. And we've had lots of talks about that, and that's not the main focus of this. Okay. But real briefly, it is currently, now maybe it shouldn't be, but it's currently a base class for a very small set of derived classes, which provide your TCP acceptor, TCP connector, and your UDP functionality. Okay. So these are the internal detail classes that Scoot uses. Okay. But it does, and this is why I put this in here, bring up an interesting constraint in C++. Start from the embankment class is a member function template, correct? Okay. So if I have a base class, net resource, and it has a virtual called start, and I'm going to pass on the message frame, the incoming message callback, and the connection state change because those are the ones that are used within those internal network resource classes. How do I pass or how do I actually have a virtual member function template? As far as I could tell, and I don't know if we've got some, well, we, uh, we must have some C gurus in here. As far as I know, there is no way to directly have a member function template virtual. And there are some technical reasons for it dealing with the, with the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the virtual tables, that V tables and stuff. So, this is what I'd like. Okay, so a base class that's templated. Okay, so member function template. So here's a, a derived class here, derived from it, okay. And I'd like to have template message frame virtual. Can't do that, okay. So it was a big dilemma. And there's another big dilemma after seeing ominous music. I don't know why vampires glitter. <laughs> I think the only reason in the Twilight movies is to make them cool looking, right? Or romantic or something. I have been to Forks about a dozen times. I didn't know there was vampires there. <laughs> Anybody else been to Forks, Washington? They actually film a little bit of the movie. Most of the movie is filmed in other places in the Pacific Northwest. But they, I think they have a shot or two of Forks itself. So Forks is a pretty small, nondescript town. And in fact, I always go elsewhere. I'm going through Forks 
you know, either to other, like the rainforest areas or up to Lake Crescent in there. So I never saw any werewolves either. Now I've been over to La Push and other areas, uh, Shishi Beach, which is near Quileute Reservation, or Quileute Land, I don't know if it's Reservation Land or whatever. Quileute's, Quileute's are the... Oh, you have the answer? Go ahead. I haven't read the book, so. Super glue and aluminum foil. Oh, super glue and aluminum foil. <laughs> I heard, I haven't seen the second and third movie, but I heard they did a better job with the glittering in the movie. You know, it's like, I'm not going to watch it unless I'm forced to, but. My son is interested, not because he's interested in the movies, because all the girls in his fifth grade class love the movie, and so he wants to know what's, uh, what, all the, what all the stuff in there. So, anyway, so we're, we were hiking up in Macaw, so. Some beautiful areas there, but I, I didn't see any vampires or werewolves in there. So, in well, the they were hiding behind the trees. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You're out in the daytime. Yeah, it's day. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Go well, but I've, isn't the glitter supposed to be because they can come out in the daytime and the glitter won't they won't burn away or something like that, right? Or is that something? Yeah. <laughs> I have seen zombies. My son has been one. I'll show you a slide here in a sec. He was uh, he was in. Um, they, they, had, they have zombie walks in, in the, uh, pretty frequently in the Seattle area, but we went to one last year because he was really in a zombie phase. I've got another story with that, which I'll take offline. But uh, we, went to, um, we went to a zombie walk, and I think it was, at least at that time, it may have been surpassed by a, a, a city in England, the largest zombie walk to date. It was on July 4th, so red, white, and dead. So that's him. <laughs> I carried a brain in front of him, and he he like did that the whole walk. It was about a half mile walk, so it's fun. Has anybody ever been to Fremont, Washington? It's very appropriate because Fremont's kind of like it's where they have the summer solstice and the naked bikers in the summer um, is one of the things they're famous for. And there's a couple other things. Fremont. The, the missile up there and the big yes. Statue yeah, yeah, statues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, yeah, in there. So this is some of the people they're all dressed up there. For so this is my hack to get around the lack of member function templates in C++. In fact, I copyrighted it up there, so you know everybody can use it, but I have my copyright on it. So, so um, I don't know if this is a good way to do it. I'll, I'll ask some of the gurus in here if there's other ways. But I decided to use variant and you know type def. There's three drive classes: an acceptor, connector, UDP pointer. Okay, and Defining in those, I've only used variant a little bit, so those of you real familiar with variant probably know exactly what's going on here. So, a little class with a template, templated <coughs> function object class there that's going to store the message frame. And in particular, this is how it's actually used. So, here's my base class. Okay. I have a method called set derived so that in the derived classes in the constructor, I'm simply saying, hey, base class, I'm really this, okay? And then in the start method, which is not virtual, okay? It's just a regular member function template. I apply the visitor, which goes out there to that instantiate, instantiates a, that start drive class. And that one, I'll go back one slide, actually calls a virtual method called start handler. So I thought that was kind of cool. Is this different than how this function does its? It just looks like type erasure. Yeah, right? yeah, it it is a form of type erasure. Yeah, yeah, D a different form. Yeah, yeah. But in, in, I couldn't find a, another. Maybe there is a better way of, in, in specifically for this. Now again, with the redesign, it, it might be a whole different kind of way of doing things. But in particular, I specifically needed the ability to call a virtual method that was templatized. And this is the only workaround I could come up with or think of. I mean, there might be other ways to do that. I think it's the same. Is it? Oh, so, so this technique's not, so I can't copyright this. Shoot, <laughs> too bad, too bad. In this particular way I'm using it, there's some drawbacks. You notice I, I put, you know, bad hack, and that's copyright Jeff Garden, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the main drawback to this is that variant, of course, is a, is a compile time. It's a closed set of types that you're giving it. So this doesn't work for a general technique. It works within the detail classes of Scoot because I know all the specific derives that I have inside there. So again, your gurus probably can come up with better ways of doing it. But I thought it was kind of cool for myself since I don't consider myself a C++ guru. 
Okay, so to shift a little bit, um, I'm going to just talk this one slide about output channel. It has some of the same requirements or goals or functionality needs and some of the same template trade-offs, or I should say design trade-offs, with the embankment. It's a lightweight value class. Its purpose is to provide the interface for the application to send data. In particular, I wanted the um, ability for an output channel to be passed around anywhere, any layer of code, and allow that, co that layer of, of software to send data, regardless of how that embankment was started, created, how, you know, what the, the callbacks were registered for the incoming data. Okay. And in particular, this is a, a, a really a need when you have applications that are freewheeling, sending data at any time. There's no coordinated flow of data. And we have a lot of that where we have things that are kind of sending data everywhere. We have some things that are requesting data, and it all kind of runs independently over the same socket connections. And I think I mentioned this briefly earlier. Is, is one of the parameters in the incoming message callbacks of the application, which is a very common thing to do is say, I want to send ba data back to where this data came in from, whether it's UDP or TCP. So why doesn't the, uh, the callback just turn around and use the same embankment to send its message? You could do that too. Oh, oh no, embankment doesn't have output sending. So, so the question Rob was, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, uh, Rob's asking about embankment and sending, and embankment has no way to receive data other than sending the, the callbacks for, for incoming data, has no way to send data either. So um, we'll look at the state machine, which is up next, uh, the next slide. And there is no, if you look at my internal code, once I get permission to actually make it public, you won't see any specific thing saying I'm in this state or in this state. But this state machine is, def is implied by the API, by the methods that you can call, and by the transitions and the way that objects are created for you. And in particular, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead and then jump back. As I mentioned, after you create a scoot object, the embankments are created for you by scoot. You can't create an embankment and associate it with an internal network resource on your own. You can only say, Scoot, give me an embankment, okay? You're gonna tell Scoot, of course, what type of embankment in the sense of whether it's a TCP listener, connector, or sender it is, okay? But you're gonna, it's gonna give you that, okay? And then output channels, you have the same issue there. Output channels are independent of the network resource itself, okay? Well, it doesn't make sense to create an output channel until you actually have a network resource available for sending data. And in that case, one of the things that the channel change callback gives you, because that's the one that invoke, gets invoked when a connection succeeds, is it gives you, in the callback, an output channel. It says application, you got a good connection, here's an output channel, you can start sending data to your heart's consent. Okay? So that takes care of that issue of, well, when is everything ready to send data? Now again, if you're writing code that's completely, you have control of all of those states in your application specific, you know that. It's embedded within the logic and the design. But when you're designing a library that's used in multiple ways, that has multiple different needs for when to send data, how they're going to send data, etc., this is a way to constrain when the application is going to have the capability when it's going to know that it's good to send data. Okay? Just like the embankment, an exception will be thrown if your network resource has gone away and you didn't handle that state within the, the, the connection state change callback. So if I go back to this one, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in here, but embankment, you know, you get one created by Scoot, you call start on it, then you're in a state where you can accept or connect. I didn't put the UDP logic in that when you basically go straight to receiving data. Although after that state, you always get a channel change callback is invoked. If you see all the arrows and for the errors, that always goes into the channel change callback. Here's an output channel where send is happening. This one also provides an output channel for sending. You get an output channel in the incoming message callback. Okay. So again, this is not a real state machine diagram, but it's, a, it's just a representation, pseudocode of what's going on in there. 
Questions? No? Okay. Okay, so here's some. Oh, yes, go ahead. It wasn't correct. Oh, did I miss something? I'm not surprised. No, no, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Like, oh, I'm, I'm sure there's. It was a little bit too much to consume. <laughs> so. it, it's, it's not complete, but it, it's got a lot of detail already. And, you know, I, so, could, I could do twice as much and it still wouldn't be complete, but it's, you know, representative. Go ahead, Jeff. Right, so I guess the, the serious question is. And maybe this is too deep a question to be asked at this time in the afternoon, but um, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, Chris and I think you saw Chris, Chris's presentation. He was talk, talking about you know these patterns and layering, and so mm -hmm. I guess you've kind of done the same thing here, right? By just saying, okay, well, I'm going to make it very simple at the top, and mm -hmm. it's the same same set of protocol underneath all the time, right? I mean, because at the beginning you said, well, I can do TCP and UDP and you haven't said how that happens yet, but are, are, are you saying the state machine and the, this concept are the same no matter which of those protocols you use? Yes. So the question was, are, are the state machines the same no matter which of the protocols you use? And, and it is yes. Now, it turns out that, for instance, if, you, if you've created a UDP embankment, okay, you call start on it. You know, uh, the internal code does a little bit of work, such as if, you, if you're doing a UDP receive, it'll go out and bind to the port. It'll call your channel change callback immediately because as soon as you've successfully bound to your port, you're good. So it'll basically skip all the, well, I'm going to have to accept, listen, or connect, right? Okay. So, you know, there, there's differences in the way the transitions happen. And, you know, again, there's still going to be a few differences you'll see in certain areas, but for the most part, but the from idea. From application point of view, you could switch those out. In the yes. So that's that's one of the one of the goals there. Yep. Okay. So we'll look at and this might be a little bit more clear as as you look at a little bit of example code. So I'm just talking. This is a fairly simple example. The wire protocol, four byte message links. Okay. It's in big Indian order, followed by a non-empty buffer of characters. Okay. So the link just tells you how many characters you got there. Okay. By the way, for the byte swapping, use the Indian library from Beeman. Okay. And what the application does is just going to be a simple message distributor. Okay. It's given a, you know, a listen port and you know, zero more connect ports, and it's going to go out there and connect to the other ones. When data comes in on any of the, the connections, it's going to send them out to the other ones. Okay. So this is the code, and we'll take as little time or as much time as you need to, although you know, we got 15 minutes left, but this is the, the code that the message frame is implemented for that. Okay, it's not super complex, but it's not super easy. If you notice, the key things, there's two methods up there, get message and get length. That's completely up to whatever you want to provide as your API inside the message frame, okay? The only thing that's required is this guy right there, okay? So that is the function object interface. Okay. And the code in here is just doing uh, you know, the collection of the data here. So I've got one state variable, which is have I got my header or not. I basically get my header, and then I go out and get my data. If you notice, I'm resizing the buff, okay, depending on the size of that. So that buffer will shrink and grow. Although I guess with a vector of char, it typically never shrinks, right? It'll just grow as needed. So those of you who have done ASIO programming, you'll, you'll recognize some of the, the buffer stuff. So hang on a second. So yep. this is the code the client writes? Yes. This is the code the client writes. I thought you didn't have to know about ASIO. It's what? I thought you didn't have to know about ASIO. Well, you know, it, it, it's a good question because um, you, Jeff brings up something. And, and you, this may be something I completely change in that if you've noticed, I've exposed a this is one of the few areas where ASIO is exposed. And there's actually a few other places where ASIO is exposed. Um, I haven't decided yet whether it should completely encapsulate ASIO or use ASIO and expose it where appropriate. I've gotten requests to allow people to change socket parameters. So, you know, it's a good question. So th that may change. Um, I'll talk real briefly about the message frame return type, which right now is three elements. There may be better ways of doing this, defining this interface. This works, and it works for a certain, it's in, actually in production right now, works for a certain class of applications. It may not be the final design. I know I want that message frame and incoming message callback relationship. I think that general design is fixed, or at least 
pretty solidified. But you know, maybe maybe this changes. So, I mean, that's why all these boosters are not afraid to give your opinions, right? Obviously, this is too early. To, you, there's not much code to look at. Well, so yeah. in, in this particular case, so uh, message frame return type. So I haven't talked about that yet. Okay, yes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But uh, and I can if you want to. No. Well, I, I mean, I'm just wondering if it's if it, if it's actually necessary, right? I mean, it's just a buffer, right? Mm -hmm. And buffer plus a boolean. Right, but the buffer is the part that has the area. So yeah. I, I don't know what the demands on that type are. Mm -hmm. Just looking at this. And uh, to expand on what, what, what Jeff is talking about with the, with the buffer, if you notice, the actual storage for the messaging is inside the message frame itself. There is actually no buffer storage inside Scoot. So that was a decision I made. It says, you know, there's all kinds of different ways, and, and this is definitely also a byproduct of the environment I work in. We have some systems, for instance, the, the multi-sensor fusion application is not quite real-time, but it wants to be a real-time app. It has uh, pretty strict requirements uh, and does a lot of array processing. And what it's doing is taking multiple sensors, you know, radars, IFFs, other things, and um, fusing all of those tracks and different information into a, a comprehensive view of the airspace or the, the ground space or whatever around the, um, um, the airplane or the, the, the platform that you're on. And um, they typically allocate all their buffers up in advance and they just have big, big buffers and they allocate them once and they don't want to ever have to reallocate. So I didn't want to do that in Scoot. On the other hand, a lot of other things don't want to allocate you know, 10 megabyte buffers. Okay, I just want this to be resized. So, it's up the application. That's Is why. The reason you didn't just return a <coughs> pointer in a length as your buffer. Well, that hide the ASIO buffer type. Uh, what Rob's asking, could I could I define it where I'm not returning ASIO buffer? Exactly. I could have something that looked exactly like an ASIO buffer. Uh, yes, Chris. I would say at that point, by using a vector and capturing it using the ASIO buffer function, you actually take advantage of ASIO's buffer debugging feature automatically, which means if you let your vector go out of scope, you'll get an assert mm -hmm. uh, inside ASIO, uh, letting you know that you haven't kept your buffer object valid. So there, are, there might be advantages to retaining the interface. Um, well, I was thinking that actually, since basically there's actually, as Rob and I were discussing, there's two cases here. and. ASIO does a nice job of abstracting this idea of a buffer. So it seems a completely appropriate usage to just say, well, this is a useful thing from this class library that I want to promote. It's either that or write it again yourself, right? Which yes. Or simply create a wrapper that hides the fact that it's under there, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I, if I put this in the early slide, I didn't mean to. I didn't say I 100% wrapped ASIO. I just took care of a lot of the messy details. So the application never sees any of the async chaining. They never have to deal with, you know, how do I, you know, design uh, this intricate boost bind in here to get my hand internal uh, handler. So, you know, ASIO buffer is a pretty straightforward utility class. Very nice one. Well, it's an so, entirely yeah. possible, mm -hmm. by the way, that ASIO buffer shouldn't even be an ASIO. Yeah, it should be a standard. Yeah. <laughs> Well, of course, if it goes in TR2, maybe it eventually does. But I mean, I mean, as you know, IO in general needs that kind of capability. So. Where, where's Boris? Is Boris here? Is he in the other? Yeah, we were talking. We were talking last night because he started a whole um, email thread about buffer, and I think you were you were involved in that one, right? Um, this is like, yeah, like four or five, well, yeah, I guess that's, that's a given. You're always <laughs> you're involved in all the, but, uh, but you know, he, 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 he was coming up with a couple of fairly simple low-level buffer type of things. And well, I think I, I replied once, but I, I got out of the thread after that. But, I mean, yeah. in, the, in the tree presentation yesterday, we were treated to another buffer. Yes. So yes. I, I, it just I, keeps coming up. I've wanted for five years a good general purpose buffer Type utility and in boost, so it'd be good to have. So well, so yeah, I mean, I guess you. And we got most of it. I think Azio Buffer has most of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question, I mean, if you want to, you know, Azio Buffer, I think is probably the, and maybe he'll 
shoot me if I say this wrong, is probably sort of the minimalist concept for a buffer yeah. possible. I mean, if you look at standard stream buff, it's a lot more sophisticated and then some. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, I just, I then, it's not just the buffer classes in ASIO, there's the buffer concepts that go along with it. So right. it's the two things together that really shouldn't be separated. Yeah. Right, agreed. Okay. So here's, here's an incoming message callback. Again, the shutdown processing is not fully fleshed out, so I just said if the first character is the next time to shut down. Um, I did put a little bit of um, error handling only in the sense that in this channel change callback, if a connection goes away, I'm going to remove it from the list. Otherwise, I'm going to add it to the list. And in the incoming message callback, okay, all I do is simply go through and do a send to all the output channels that I have available to me. Okay. So if you notice, the incoming message callback, okay, there's that message frame passed into it, there's the output channel over there. In this case, I'm actually not using the output channel because I want, all I'm going to say is that when the data comes in, I just send it to everybody, which may be the same channel, but probably is. It's probably a bug, but... So here's a channel change. I'm not doing much with it right now. As you can see, there's minimal error handling. But of the parameters, there's actually a fourth one that I didn't list in there, which is just the number of logical associations for this uh, for this channel. But as you can see, there's the output channel, which you can start using at that point. The bool just says whether something was good or not, whether it's created or not. Error for the error handling. So far, so good. And this is the full application. Okay. So I create a scoot object, okay. and I also have an interface that if you have an I.O. service created elsewhere, you can pass it in, it'll use that I.O. service. Otherwise, default constructor uses an internal. So I cre create me a TCP acceptor or a listen embankment. In this case, the, the create TCP acceptor method actually does take one parameter. Then I go through and create all my connectors. Now I said over here, connection info. There's actually three parameters to that. One is the, the host, and the other is the, the port, and the third one is a timeout for a reconnect, because I have an internal timer that will reconnect if, uh, if the connection fails. Okay. And then I start the connectors. Ah, here's where there's a little bit more complicated code. Okay. In this case, I'm binding to the message distributor object right up here for the channel change callback. Okay. Then I'm passing in a message frame, just create it right here. And then I'm binding to that same object up there for the incoming message callback. Okay. I have another section which I don't think we're going to get into, and it's probably, you know, most of you probably know it well enough, so it's probably not, not appropriate for this group here. Another section on bind and function objects in general. Okay, so we're going to do that. So then I start the listen. I could have started this up here if I wanted to, probably wouldn't make a difference. Then do run. And that's it. So these these two two or three slides is all the code for this particular example. Yeah, question. How often does your change callback and your other callbacks um, not end up being bound to the same management variable? Oh, a good question. So so the question is you know, how often does, does this get bound to an, in a, an object like this? I have... Not only that, but how often is, if you're binding it, the other one's not bound the same, to the same object? Very, very frequently. So how often is it, you know, the question was, how often is it bound to, to different objects? Uh, I have example code, uh, test unit test code, that does it five or six different combinations. Um, sometimes it's, it's bound as, the, as a this, you know, this is kind of binding to this. Sometimes I just have a standalone class with the, with the function object interface. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, this is probably one of the few times where I've bound both the incoming message callback and the um, uh, connection change callback for acceptor and a, and a connector to the same object. But typically they're different logic and different code. Okay, but, you know, so it's, it's and that, that's one of the, the goals of this is to allow that flexibility. Okay, so good so far? 
Okay, so I don't know if we'll spend too much time on here, but th this is some, some questions, discussion points there. And again, switching TCP to UDP, very few changes. The message frame code actually would have to change it a little bit. So if we, if we go back to that one. This logic with state will not work for UDP. Because what happens when you, in this case over here, you provide to Scoot and say, go out and read me the data. Will you get the header and then the next thing you'll get the body? Nope, you get it all. Okay. So the logic of this would change for UDP. Not substantially, but it would change, okay, because logic. However, this guy right here should be exactly the same for TCP, or TCP versus UDP. Because there's nothing specific. When this guy gets called, you got a message, whether it came in as a, as a datagram or a stream of bytes and was parsed by the message frame. Same for this, although with UDP, those connection state changes are gonna happen immediately, whereas with TCP, it'll be a delay as things you know connect up and happen in there. Connection direction is also pretty simple. I mean, you can create a, an acceptor versus creating a connector. The interfaces to the embankment are the same. Okay, just the way you create it is a little different. I'm not going to talk about the threading, but this example was purposely written so that I didn't have to start a separate thread. But very frequently, after I create the scoot object, I'll create a separate thread that simply does one thing, and that's run the run method, just like you see in, all, in many of the ASIO examples. Start a thread, in fact, I do a boost bind and bind to um, scoot colon colon run. Okay. Uh, yeah, we won't talk about the rest of it. Okay. So, we got two minutes. This is my former, former uh, manager, and I, I love this. So, I'm not going to talk too much about testing. I'm a big believer in unit testing, regression testing. I love this. And in fact, I talked to him yesterday. I said, can I put this up here? I'll give you attribution. I was wanting to make sure he was the one that wrote these. So I think it's true. You've seen, this is common sense. You've seen a lot of this before. What's the fourth one? Tested deliverable. Um, you know, if you're creating a, you know, a, we have both unit tests, regression tests, um, although the simulation group is not really good at unit tests yet. I'm trying to change that ethos, okay? Pretty good set of high-level regression tests, but there's also, in addition to that, integration tests that are done with the actual, we create a package. I mean, it's, it's a fairly big, many executables, many um, shared objects and or DLLs that go along with it and config files. We actually make sure we test that, not just the unit tests and the regression tests, et cetera. So. But, my former manager, he has a story for each one of these. So he's, you know, I don't have all the details, but I want to get all those, you know. There's, you know, pain and blood that's associated with these, each of those rules. Okay. So, yeah. I have unit tests for these mock classes, so it sounds like a lot of people know that, so I'm not going to go into that. Yeah. This is key. Ability to change a library or your, whatever your code to quickly verify nothing is broken. I consider that priceless. And a lot of developers I work with don't do that. They don't, they don't test something for a month. They'll code for a month, and then they throw a big pile of stuff together and start testing, and they wonder why it takes them another month to get it working. Okay, so this is the bind stuff. I'm not going to get into that. And ISO handles function objects, function object with state, binding function members. So I'm still working on permissions. Is Lucanus here? He said he took him seven months to work through Intel for uh, the Polygon library. So I'm hoping it doesn't take me that long. <laughs> Eventually, I'll like to put this out for review. You know, worst case, I'll get lots of uh, you know, good suggestions and improvements. Best case, it becomes either part of CPP NetLib or a library, Boost Library on its own. Okay. Again, there's things in here that are not cast in stone. I mean, I think the general functionality and goals are pretty pretty set. If we change the, a lot of the main focus, it becomes a different library. But a lot of the, the, the trade-offs we talked about could be, could be different. Okay. And, by the way, this doesn't necessarily have to be TCP, UDP. It could be serial I.O. or other things, just like I.O. And is it one of the talks coming up on other non-networking uses of ASIO? Uh, Extensions? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, similar, similar here. I've hopefully designed something that can be extensible there. So, I've got to get uh, 
big majestic mu music here. <laughs> so I'm glad Jeff let me have some fun with them. I'm, I'm glad Chris did too there. So I haven't met D. Michael Bowers yet, but I think Michael Case was here last year. I use he's got an excellent tutorial out there if you haven't seen it. Okay. These are co-workers, you don't know any of them. The, Boeing gives me a steady paycheck though, so. And even though I talked a lot about ASIO, I quit the music. Okay. Even though, even though I talked a lot about ASIO, there's some great libraries in Boost and, and there's some wonderful, you know, you all know that, you wouldn't be here otherwise, so thanks to all that, so. Okay. That's it. Thank you.